Rosie's been very greedy. She's got a chrysanthemum tucked behind each ear and Rob has none. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just more fun than a barrel full of monkeys. That's all I can say. <laughs> it's got tithonias and ricinus and cameras. This is my um, sexy tulip of the year. I don't know if, if that's, that's the thing. But um, this is like the Alexis Carrington Colby of the tulip world. That phlebodium is, is just super fantastic. I mean, it looked just... Ah, la, 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 yeah. I can't envy. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to what is clearly a slightly different edition of Talking Dirty. For the first time in two years, illness has finally undone us. So it'll be next week that you get a brand new guest on the pod. So what we've done is pull together some of our favourite moments, our guests, bits of advice, top plants from the past couple of years and squeeze them into about half an hour. Obviously, therefore, missing out loads of great guests and plants, etc. from all the last 80 plus episodes. We'll link below to all of the full episodes that our guests are featured in. So if you can't remember them, maybe you missed them the first time round. You can go and watch that video in full. I'll hand over to Dan and Mark. Mark from Surreal Succulents to kick our highlights off. Until next week, happy gardening. If you put this in in full sun, it goes the most electric red. I mean, as bright as a rose, if You'll not brighter. Unlike aeoniums, the samponiums don't go dormant because sempervivum's growing season is in the summer. Mm. And these guys just, like we, we've had them in sort of 40, 45 degree tunnels. They just don't go dormant with heat or with light. Yeah, they grow all year round. So that's another great. kind of breakthrough. Yeah. It's a very special feature yeah. about them. I think the the rosette as well. If you can get close to the middle of the rosette, it looks like our logo from our website, which is quite cool. <laughs> Look at that advertising. Look at that. <laughs> it really is. This one is Helianthus origalis. Don't pronounce it incorrectly because it sounds like an orgy. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> this is the this is the willow leafed Helianthus. So. Um, but it's better than the straight willow leafed one because the foliage is reasonable. Salicifolius, yeah. yeah. So Salicifolius gets really, really tall and never flowers, whereas this one flowers reliably. Um, and it's beautiful yellow flowers on here and thin. And I don't find it um, too difficult and it doesn't spread too much but it's a, it's a great one and i love the fact that it's got lovely thin foliage so it goes up really really tall something around about two meter two meter fifty uh for the back of the border this against vernonia looks stunning yeah absolutely stunning so it yes. would be right up here somewhere up in the skyline um these beautiful yellow flowers and it started flowering probably about oh three weeks ago but it, you know i really am a champion for the taller plants, because if you go to a garden centre, you won't find these tall plants available at all. So the Leucanthemellas and the Venonias, the big Helianthus, they're not there. And then people go to these gardens and they see them in, in you know, in Wisley and they see them in collection or NGS gardens and they want them and they can't find them. So that's where the smaller grower wins out because we grow them, we know what they do and people can then get their back of the border herbaceous stuff. So it's really great. So this is architectural and free flowering and, and straight salicifolia. I just, you know, it will flower, but it's usually in flower in November and gets frosted off. Whereas this is flowering now much, much earlier. It's a really great plant. And if you go to Beth Chateau's, they've got it there in the in the dry garden and along the um, by the uh, water in the garden there in lovely clumps. And it looks great. And it doesn't need staking. It holds itself up. Wow. That's a great thing. That is one of the great things I think that, about tall plants, and that is that they they have to be um, fairly sturdy and hold themselves up. Um, I grow a helianthus called Miss Mellish. I don't know whether you know that one, but the one thing about her, I think she really is an origalis. I'll say it very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> she she does words. spread. She, she puts herself about a bit. <laughs> Which is almost too much, and um, you know she's uh, she's a beautiful thing though. Slightly curved petals, very nice. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, there are a lot of really lovely helianthus out there, and there are some great ones. I mean, we do Sheila's Sunshine, which is about three meters tall, and quite. I got that. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Yay! 
yeah and it, it but it's great against an evergreen hedge or something yes. like that it's fantastic mine is next to a yew hedge yeah, yeah. And, next, and, it and i've got it growing off. next to a tree dahlia that flowers with purple flowers and i mean it just looks spectacular it's it's, it's I mean, yeah i think i think rosie there's got to be a concentrated effort to educate gardeners to love yellow <laughs> Oh, God, absolutely. This is, this is my thing. Absolutely. I'm on a one woman mission. Get as much yellow in there as possible because yeah. you, everyone wants blue, lilac, pink, maybe white. And then you, you look at it and it's a haze. You don't see the individuals. Stick a little bit of yellow in there and suddenly, pow, you see everything else around it. And Thank people you. just. <laughs> don't understand this you've got to use yellow absolutely this is a real wow plant for me and something i've used in, in lots of different gardens and lots of different forms of so we'll see if i can uh, if i can show you well so it's a form of um lobelia but of course it's not the the standard lobelia that you have for bedding that's lobelia erinus which is this tiny little annual plant which comes from from south africa this is actually a form of lobelia speciosa so as you can see, it is a much, much, much larger plant. Um, it's a lovely, uh, lovely thing. It's about, about to go into my garden if I don't wreck it. Um, and so it starts flowering around about now. And what's lovely is, you know, most, most gardens are sort of starting to look a bit tired or, or, or sad at the moment. But this is really coming into its, into its own. And this will flower all the way through till October. It's, uh, the form is called Hadspen Purple. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's, that's Lady of Shalott, which just, I mean, it just flowers nonstop. It starts, it starts in sort of late May, early June, um, and it'll just carry on going almost continuously right through until, I mean, it'll still be trying to flower in sort of um, October, November, even December. Uh, and it just depends on, on what the weather's like. So this is, um, can be grown either as a shrub or a climber. We've got it as a, a shrub in our garden here. Uh, and. It's not the best for fragrance, but it, uh, on a good day, uh, it, uh, it it is very, very good indeed, actually, and the most beautiful colour. And, and that, you can imagine that with something like Aster, Aster Monk or something like that. The whole key to sweet peas is a, deep, is a big root run. So when you sow them in November, you don't want masses of top growth. So you grow what's gr called growing them hard. You keep them very cool and you just, once they've germinated, you just want them to grow very slowly because that means that they're just putting more root down and less of all this stuff that ends up on the windowsill when you think, should I cut it off and all that. So, um, so that, that's what you're aiming for really when you sow them. Um, and then the spring sown ones, sometimes they just catch, catch up straight away with the autumn sown ones. And you think, well, what was the point of sowing them in the autumn? <laughs> <laughs> but this year there is about a two week um, difference for us. So, and then as, as Alan said, have a go in you know, May as well, get some late, you know, get some September. September flowers as well. What they really love is that period we had this year of misty mornings. They love that that misty mornings and then some sunshine on them. So they net so they get plenty of uh, moisture early on. Um, what they don't like is these horrible springs we've been having recently, where you get a glorious Easter say, and then it goes very dull and wet. That that stress stresses them a lot. We've found that we can ameliorate that by. Um, putting um, round the cones that we grow them on, we put um, fleece to about this high, and that just gives them a little microclimate to just stable, stabilize the, the, this heat, cold, hot, cold, you know. Because um, if they get going well, they usually just keep going well. This is this is my um, sexy tulip of the year. I don't know if, if that's that's the thing, but um, this is like the Alexis Carrington Colby of uh, the tulip world. It's it's a sort of very very eighties lipstick pink, and it's it's like um, shot silk. I don't know how easy it is to see, but that's called a, a tiller graffiti, and I I quite like those two together. I think if you can see them together. Yeah. But I do like those kind of colour combinations, strong, strong colours. This is, um, I've cut a few stems. This is uh, Pulvia Lenta. And it actually it seeds and clumps up. Um, and, it, it, you know, you can divide it, you know, every two or three years. But it, the, the camera's not really showing off. It's quite an intense pink. Yeah. Um, and it's and you can see the emerging buds. Um, I don't know if that's doing justice. And it, we've, we've, it goes right down the side of the pond. And we've spread it out and split it and divided it. So it runs sort of down the end of the pond and down the end of the stream. And, um, you know, it's not a huge area. It's maybe like 15 metres, but 
Um, that's one of my favourites, um, and it's really easy to grow. He likes it. You know, they can handle quite quite full sun if they've got plenty of moisture under their feet. Yeah. But yeah. semi shade, semi shade, um, they'll do well as well. So, so interestingly, so that's probably onto. And I've got one that we're going to introduce, and this is um, Secundiflora, and um, which is you can. I'm going to put them together. It's a bit more dainty. Um, it's a very very similar pink, and it's. Again, it, it bulks up well, and rather than having, I'll leave that there for a second. Um, rather than having them all cross, I try, we try to plant different species that flower successionally so that we can deadhead them before the next lot comes into seed. So for instance, in one area under the tree ferns, we've got um, Primula japonica millers crimson, which is lovely. And that does its thing in mid-May to, to June. And then that dies down, and we've got the Himalayan cowslip, Primula florindi. So that flowers after. So we make sure that we get head them so that we don't cross-pollinate, you don't get the high hybrids when they start to get the past clear colours. And then further through the garden, we have um, Primula beziana, we've got Bulliana, and then we've got some really new ones. Mark's just introduced some um, Sebaldii types, and then some really ones I've never seen before, like Muscarioides and Belledifolia. It just the list goes on and on and on for for, um, for primulas, but this is this is one that I'd like to see naturalised in the garden. So with no dig, you're, you're just thinking more what what is natural, and and just working out how you can do that. Starting out no dig, it can be difficult because you've got to get rid of weeds if you're starting with a weedy plot. And how do you do that without digging? And no, there's no need to remove the turf or anything like that. But it is cut. That's where cardboard. Is. I mean, you know, that's probably wasn't around for the Victorians. So. Um, brown cardboard. Some people worry about the glues and things in cardboard, and I don't really know. I've done, investigated as much as I can. Uh, I saw a study from Stanford University which found that fungi in the soil actually eat glues. You know, they positively enjoy them. Well, I don't know if they phrased it quite like that. But there are possibilities to um, get rid of weeds in very natural ways, and you only need to do that once. Um, you know, this is where I find actually teaching can, can lead you up into difficulties, because then some people seem to think that you have to use cardboard every year. And you don't, you know, it's just an initial one-off phase. Get rid of the weeds and then no more cardboard after that. So it's, it's quite a minimal dose. Um, and, and a slightly hard dose of compost at the beginning, maybe um, two, three inches, five, seven centimetres. Depends how, how much weed you've got, how much compost you can get hold of. But it's, it's a one-off using a, a larger initial dose. And then going forwards every year, I'm putting on now on my beds about one inch, three centimetres, something like that, of compost. To maintain the biological activity, think of it in terms of, not bringing in nutrients so much as stimulating soil life to provide the nutrients which are there already. Most soil is actually in pretty good state nutrient wise, not all, but most. So it's, you're enabling. Rabies, is it Laurifolium? Yeah. Laurifolium. And it's a bit more of a scrambling beast and it likes to sort of trail a bit, but this is a super thing in the garden at the moment. It's been flowering for weeks. The great thing about that is it fulfills so many people's dreams being sort of lemony cr limey green i mean that that green flower I've, I've got that in the well i'm not going to say i've got it now because I, I i did have it with lime green hellebores underneath it and it, they look stunning together but i think that may be a piece of garden that's got rather neglected so i don't know whether it's still there but i definitely have amy doncaster and the great thing about amy doncaster is the fact that that shrub will grow in a north facing position so it will grow in shade yeah. And it is beautiful as well. We yeah. can almost relive your conversation. Hey! <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like we planned it. <laughs> Just hold those two up together again because, uh, you know, so people can see how well. Yeah, you see, it's lovely, isn't it? One of the things I discovered with aerial rooting climbers, that it's very difficult to get them to stick to the walls, to climb up the walls. And uh, a chap who was working here at the time, said, well, haven't you tried this system? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bit complicated to explain. You like that? So you might get bored. You might fall asleep by the time I've finished. <laughs> well, I always recommend getting the plant like this rather than on a stick. Yep. Um, it, it's fine leaving, having them up, growing on a stick um, to keep them uh, out of trouble. They snap quite easily. They're fairly uh, flimsy. But... Uh, um, what we do is we get a plant like this, dig a hole, for, obviously, for the roots, and then um, you plant it 30 centimetres away from the wall, so you want to keep metric. Parallel to the wall. No, no, the, the actual roots, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. main roots. Yeah, and then you run these 
long stems parallel to the wall, at, at least 15 centimetres away from the wall. And you bury them. So peg them down. Bury them. No, no, don't peg them down. You bury them. Right. You just have the growing tips, the tiny leaves here. Yeah. Uh, sticking out of the ground. So they can photosynthesize. Then what you'll find is like you see ivy growing in a forest. That's what you're trying to mimic. They will send up a shoot and it'll creep along the ground. And you'll get what I call terrestrial roots from those. And as soon as it hits the wall, it gets aerial roots and it goes up like a rocket. I, I reckon you can uh, save a minimum of three years by doing that. Oh, that's terrific. Um, yeah. we it's, put, a, it's a really good tip, actually. Yeah. yeah. We, we put in um, Skies of Fragma Integrifolia. Mm. I don't know whether you've planted that. Yeah, yeah. Hydrangea um, relative. Yeah, it's, got, it's quite notorious of being slow. Yeah. Well, three years, we, it was up a 20-foot wall. <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> that is an extremely this. long leaf. It is, um, and I'm not even sure that this plant is is fully uh, fully grown. It, it can this leaf can get a lot longer, and it only ever makes one per bulb. And then on the top of, let's see if I can get it into the camera. Oh look! Get these. Oh look at that. Um, I'll get a good picture of it for for you. Uh, six petaled star shaped flowers uh, that smell like pond water. So it's <laughs> it's, a, it's an unusual one again. Uh, and that one is uh, Gethium atropurpureum. My next thing is not variegated, just in case everyone thinks I only have variegated plants. This is the crested form of the hare's foot fern. <gasps> so it, it's Flabodium aureum, which everyone knows the hare's foot fern, and it's a, a cultivar called Davana, D-A-V-A-N-A. -A -A. It looks like curled parsley. That it's is fabulous. absolutely astonishing. I am almost speechless. Um, cool, everybody right? needs this plant. <laughs> Thunder, that'll never happen. <laughs> that that Flabodium is, is just super fantastic. I mean, it looked just, ah, no, 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 <laughs> so my my office is north facing here i've got two quite big windows north facing and it's really happy so there's not much direct light at all and it's very dull in the winter but it's it's good it's huge you've got to look at their origins they are basically a man-made plant but the two parents are both um mountain plants and they grow between three and eight thousand feet so they need light they need lots of air you know which they get on the mountain top yeah. and they want to be cool particularly cool at the root right and those are the three key things that i think you need to bear in mind one of my favorite posts from you the other day was how you'd been auditioning your auriculars to go in the theater <laughs> yeah i love doing that just picking out the nicest ones to, to put on display and so how got... long how long were you auditioning your auriculars for jane ann it took me 10 hours. <laughs> <laughs> I've got 700 plants about and, um, you know, they've all got to be sort of staked and looking lovely. It's ridiculous. But, you know, why grow them if you can't sort of show them and enjoy them? And what Cosmias do as they grow is they make the new corm underneath and then they make the new corm underneath. And when a Procosmia has been in for about five years, it goes down very deep and there's a string of corms and this helps its hardiness so with this crocosmia which i have lost before and i advise everybody to do this if they buy crocosmia at this time of year is to put it in a pot not in the garden and allow it to have a couple of years in a pot so that it can develop some corms deeper corms underneath we call them shapes in the landscape yep and the shape closest to us is the one that had the weeping ash in it and that yeah. where the weeping ash was is now just this amazing bombast of color. You know, it's just more fun than a barrel full of monkeys. That's all I can say. <laughs> it's got tithonias and ricinus and uh, camas. Should I go through the individual plants? Yes, please. Why not? <laughs> uh, okay, there's loads of different things. Ricinus is the uh, uh, castor oil plant. Here we are. And this one's New Zealand black. It reflects the light. So the 
the, it's the darkest color you can imagine, but it reflects the light. So it's looking pale. Can I, if I go around the corner, will it look darker? Oh, no, it just does. It's the, it has a beautiful texture to the petal, sort of satiny and reflective, even though the color is really dark. Um, and I love that. I like, I love dark foliage, which is reflective. So it catches the light. Uh, these are insanely big. They're about as tall as I am. Uh, and they were sown at the end of April. So they've been, they are, what is it? May, June, July. They're three and a half months old and five foot tall. You Whoa. know, I just, anything that does that. And also behind them is the Tithonia, the brilliant orange. Can you see these? Yeah, that yeah. Glorious. brilliant orange, like they're called the Mexican sunflower, but they're not really sunflowers, but it's the most wonderful glowy, glowy orange. And they're five foot tall, again, sown at the end of April. So, I mean, with annuals, you can make the most extreme amount of volume and color and size and bold, dramatic stuff going on, which is, I love that. Um, there are some things that aren't annuals. There's a wonderful canna here called Tropicana Black. Has a red flower. There's one over on the other side, which is in flower. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> whoops, whoops. <laughs> uh, whoops, the flowers are going over a bit, but you get the color. So yeah. Yeah. that's also has the high drama color, uh, wow. but this wonderful leaves. And again, that sort of sheen on the leaf that reflects the light, although they're very dark, they reflect the light, which is just, I think, beautiful and sets off the orange amazingly. And then is in amongst everything else down below, we have this lovely uh, coleus, a, a extraordinary coleus, which is somehow red, orange, and purple all at the same time. Um, and a tiny new zinnia, this was new last year. There's maybe, a, they, they, they change color and there, I'm, there should be some dark red ones. I don't see any dark red ones here, but they change color from orange to yellow and orange and red. It's called Zahara fire. And that stays very small. That's only about eight inches high and makes a little dwarf sort of clump, very tidy minded plant. <laughs> and a new Bidens, or at least new for me. Am I gonna remember the name? It's so new. <laughs> Something Margarita. Does that make sense? Do you know this, Alan? No, I, well, there's a whole range of them that have been brought out as patio plants, but I didn't look at them to be quite honest. I know. I th I mean, I didn't. I don't approve of things like tiny little Bidens here, but they have been wonderful. They just they have flower and flower. Oh, here's a really good one. They yeah. just flower their silly socks off for months. They never so that, stop. That just and shows. They sort of sparkle. Terry, Sorry, Terry, that just shows the importance of trialing a plant and using it, even yes. if you don't like it. Just use it and see what it does. Yeah, yeah. And you really almost it's wonderful to see it in somebody else's garden or in a trial garden but it's the best way to really know about a plant is to grow it yourself yeah, yeah. if you don't grow it yourself you don't really know how good it is how bad it is on a bad day <laughs> yeah yeah and that coleus um, the combination of the coleus the bidens that little zinnia yeah it means that your carnival bed has this absolute carpet of different shades of orangey pinky Yes. Oh, it's, yes. it's it's such an amazing, um, such an amazing and carpet at the bottom. The other thing that's hiding in there that you can't really see is there's some double nasturtiums, red and orange. Here's the double oh. nasturtium. That's uh, Margaret Long, very double. So this is Benari's uh, giant orange zinnia, which I never liked Benari's zinnias before. In fact, I never really liked zinnias before, but I've come around to them this year. <laughs> and here's the little cosmos I was talking about. Cosmos sulfurous, um, cosmic red. It's not, uh, oops, never mind. Uh, it's actually, it looks paler than it is. In real life, that's bright orange. I, it looks to me kind of pale in there. And above it, you see the grass, this yeah. lovely, yeah. delicate grass, which is growing through everywhere on top of everything else, just sort of softening it. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah. Um, you get, it's called frosted explosion and it's the best cut flower thing there ever was. At every stage is a good cut flower. It lasts forever. It makes other plants look good. Um, if you have, you know, thing like heavy, like dahlias and you put some of this frothy, thin, beautiful things. They're beautiful when they're fully open. They're beautiful when they're just beginning to come open. They're just lovely. Even in seed, they're really nice. 
just that just one wanna... flower bed, Derry, is just so much inspiration in that one flower bed. No wonder there, you keep there's going so and much looking fun at it. In it. It's, just a, it's such a hoot. That's what. It's fabulous. I love it. And this is, if I can get it in shot, um, Elymas canadensis. And this is a lovely bluey grey leafed and flowered version called Icy Blue. Um, and these bottle brush like plumes are they're enormous. They're, well, you can say full length of my hand and at least half the width of my, my hand wide. This is my favourite fern I own. And it's uh, hard to pronounce this one Neoleposaurus ovatus. And it's Neoleposaurus ovatus variegata. So there is a plain green form, and this is the variegated form. And those leaves are absolutely beautiful. They're my favourite fern I grow. It's everybody that comes in says, can I have a cutting? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't actually split it yet. And, and, and until it fills this pot completely, I'm not going to, because I just love it. It's, it's, it's the most magnificent fern. Has it had any spores on the underside of the leaves yet? Uh, no, it hasn't. No, I don't think any of these have produced spores. Oh, yes. Very, very simple spore. Yeah, in fact, I think that one is as well. Oh, yeah, look. Yeah. First time I've seen that. I wonder yeah. if you could take a leaf off and lay it on some, do you think? Possibly. I, I, I do try ferns from spores. Yeah. Uh, it's A lot of people just take the leaf off, and the, the stuff that actually comes off is mainly chaff. It's hardly yeah. a spore. I use some um, cartridge paper, uh, like watercolour paper. Yeah. Put the, put the fronds on that, let them dry out overnight. And, you, and it'll be loads of spore. And people say, oh, look at all this spore. That's not spore, that's chaff. And what you do then is you gently tip the paper up, tap the paper, and all the chaff falls off and you're left with a very fine dust and it's microscopic dust. That's the spore. And that's ah. what you should sow. So people sow the chaff and then the chaff rots and, and you get uh, mold and mildew and that. So the spore is incredibly fine. You use a a very fine brush to brush it all together. And that's what you have to sew. You have to sew it very thinly because each one's a fern. I would say that my garden is also a real plant man's garden. I remember the first time I went to England and saw uh, the description, a real plant man's garden. It could also be a plant woman's garden. I think, what is that? What is a plant man? But I like to grow. I like to grow uh, from seeds and from cuttings and uh, grow a lot of plants. I also need to say that I have uh, two full-time gardeners, but I always say that I am the head gardener. <laughs> I also think, uh, Alan, your garden is quite big. Yes, it's 32 acres. Yes, oh my goodness. How many <laughs> gardeners do you have? Well, we have, um, we have two full-time gardeners, and I think we have um, a team that comes in three, two and three days a week, and there's probably three of those. And um, Alan. And... <laughs> <laughs> the powerhouse that is Alan. <laughs> Hello. 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 I thought that I couldn't not have some plants. I'm in the office and there's no plants in the office. So um, I was at the folks this morning for a coffee um, and I thought I'd cut a few bits. So I've got some roses in here. I've got some lovely um, hosta flowers from a lovely hosta called Praying Hands, which is lovely. I've got some salvias in here, some salvia Jezebel, which is a well-known variety. Um, some agastache, some lovely agastache from Mexico, which is also very good. And a couple of really good fuchsias. I'm a big fan of fuchsias. So just fuchsia ricatoniae in here, which is lovely. And this one here is really nice. I got this from Wales a few years ago, and it's called Chillerton Beauty. And it's absolutely lovely. It's a great hardy fuchsia. It really is fantastic. So I thought, well, at least I can show you a few flowers and the scent from these roses oh it's absolutely fantastic and i love propagating like bananas my plan was to do a whole area of bananas this year like over 100 bananas or more um and i grew them i didn't have the patience to wait to sow the seed until spring and i sowed it all in the autumn and they all came up and i spent weeks showing off from the internet um how amazing the bananas were and then they all died um they just didn't like you know they were Small banana plants going through winter, they get green fly, they're all dead. Um, but anyway, I'll buy all the seed again and I'll sow it now at the proper time in, in March. There's over a thousand varieties and bearded irises alone now. Uh, and we, we have loads of different sabiricas and daylilies and all sorts of other stuff growing in the beds. Like the fin collection is now making its way, pushing irises out of the way in the shady spots. 
Um, so it, it, it's really um, f- finding what I had, if you like, for that first year, and then working out what I was going to do with it. <laughs> I, I always think they're a bit like myself, really. They're quiet most of the time, but when they when they start talking, you can't shut them up. You know, they're just out there. You know, look at me, very very show it. Even the smallest of ones are eye catching. I think that makes them really quite unique for certainly this climate, you know, early season. So um, yeah, I'll be a lot of people who come in who just would never have thought of having Iris, and then they walk out with one. <laughs> they can't help it. <laughs> They have these wonderful, big, rich green paddle-like leaves um, that rocket out of the ground to about eight or nine feet. And then these pendulous pink flowers, rich pink, that you that dangle and you can look up into, depending on how tall you are, of course. <laughs> but even me, at six foot three, by the end of the summer, I am looking up into uh, these flowers. It's just the most wonderful exotic cannas i think if you if you want to start and you're not into exotics yet um they're so easy you want to start with something that's easy you don't want to be put off by growing something that perhaps is too difficult and then you give up because you get disheartened yeah try with something that you get a huge amount of reward from first and then get hooked onto other things later on 